we were talking to her about a funeral, she actually did not want a funeral. And then we convinced her that, well, the funeral isn't for you, mom, it's for everybody else. And then she actually started planning it for us and telling us how to do it. We will uh, start today though, by having an opening song, hymn uh, 124, after which Kylie Moreno, uh, Noreen's granddaughter, will give the opening prayer. And then the first uh, talk will be given by my sister Kay. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and for the chance we have to celebrate um, Noreen's life. And we're grateful for um, the love that she has shown each of us. And we ask thee to bless us this day. I will be able to receive an extra measure of comfort and that we'll be able to um, celebrate her life and her legacy. And we thank thee for these things. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I would just like to share a little bit about my mom's life with all of you. Um, Noreen was born in, on March 9, 1931, in Amalga, Utah, to Bernice and Jor Royal Jorgensen at her family home. She was the sixth child. She had two older sisters, Beth and Ruth, and two older brothers, Dell and Ray, and one older brother, Clarence, who had died as an infant. Three years later, she was joined by her brother, Keith. She grew up on a small dairy farm during the Great Depression and gained early life skills in frugality and hard work. She loved riding her pony, playing with collie dogs and nearby cousins. On her sixth birthday, she came down with scarlet fever, and as there were no antibiotics at the time, she suffered a lifelong loss of hearing as a result. As a child, she had a talent to lay on her stomach, wrap her legs around her back, and tuck them under her chin, and could do inverted, car inverted rolls. If you saw her video, you saw a film that was actually made in 1941 of her doing that. Um, she actually, as a fifth grader, got to perform with the um, junior high gymnastics team because she had so, such great tumbling skills. She later attended Utah State University, where she obtained her bachelor's degree and met my dad, Don Cronquist, and married him in 1953 in the Idaho Falls Temple. After college, my parents moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, where I was born. My mom taught home economics and physical education in elementary, middle school, and high school. On the day that I was born, my father was officer of the day, and um, technology was what it was back then. That meant he was required to sit in a room with a red telephone that connected directly to the president and his staff in case they called him with an emergency, and he was not allowed to leave the room for any reason. So he didn't come and meet me and my mom until the day after I was born. Next, we moved to Portadone, Italy, where my brother Douglas was born. Our family lived in the Italian community of Portadone rather than on the Air Force Base of Yano, where my dad was stationed. My mom loved Italy. She learned Italian, and she often loved riding the city buses and being able to understand the conversations around her. One day, she overheard several ladies talking about how grateful they were that they didn't live anywhere near where there were bombs. Now, my mom knew that that wasn't true, but it was top secret, so she could not uh, share in this conversation on the bus. While living in Europe, she took advantage of visiting all the different countries that were so close by. She was even able to go to Denmark and meet up with relatives who still remembered her ancestors who had immigrated to the United States. Returning from Italy, we settled in Stillwater, Oklahoma, where both my parents attended Oklahoma State University. My mom obtained a master's degree there in early childhood education. She took my brother Douglas with her to class and featured him in her thesis. The next move landed us in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is where my brother Stephen was born. My mom loved to try out different cuisines and often cooked amazingly big and fancy Sunday dinners. While in New Mexico, she learned to cook everything with tortillas and had multiple course Mexican dinners she served us. She also loved to cook lobster, king crab, and artichokes. We loved those dinners. She also cooked cow's tongue and liver, which we did not love so much. After Albuquerque, we moved to Washington, D.C. and lived in a suburb called Oxon Hill in Maryland. Here, my mom loved taking in all the historical sites. And if you visited us, you got tours of the Smithsonian's, the White House, the National Zoo, Gettysburg, Mount Vernon, and many other places. Through friends she made and through my father's work in the Air Force, we were often able to go to places many people couldn't access. We were able to go to Andrews Air Force Base and shake the hand of presidents who landed there on Air Force One. And my mom actually visit taught in the White House as one of the ladies on her visiting teaching route worked there. My mom had a talent for sewing and learned the skill from her mother and broadened it by taking courses in pattern and garment design. She loved making her own clothes and adding unique touches to them. She taught me how to sew at an early age, but did so by bringing in the neighborhood girls to learn with me because I was too sassy to teach by myself. She also combined her love of children and playing the piano by teaching piano lessons for many years. In going through her 
memories after she passed, I came across a note one of her students wrote her. Dear Mrs. Cronquist, I'm glad you're my teacher. You are a very, 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 very nice teacher, and I like that. I hope you don't quit teaching kids piano. Well, gotta go. Bye. Love, Criselda Vo. While living in different states, we usually made a yearly trek back to Logan each summer to visit. We learned to love the places that she knew growing up, and the road trips to get us to Logan also enabled us to visit many of the different states. Sometimes as a child, I felt like we stopped at every single historical marker along the road. But I used this knowledge to win my fifth grade contest to name all 50 states. The last place my mom lived was here in Logan with many of you. She was excited to build her home back here where she loved getting back to her roots, her relatives, and finding new friends in her neighborhood. She had a deep and abiding faith, always believed in her savior and his love. She served in many ways in the church, including being the president of the Relief Society and primary, but her favorite calling was leading the music in primary. And following my talks, my daughter and granddaughters are going to play the song that they remember most associated with her. She was frugal, stubborn, and fiercely independent. She loved learning, sewing, playing the piano, cooking regional dishes, growing her garden, children, Danish modern furniture, and the color turquoise. But what my brothers and I will remember her for was being our mom, raising us in the best way she could and helping us become who we are. My wish for you, mom, is found in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds we love you, Mom, now and forever.
Thank you, Kylie, Lily, and Addy. It was very nice. I want to share a few thoughts about my mother and share with you what she was to me. Um, when I, I, before I retired, I worked for a large international uh, oil company, and they had a very formal performance review process. And I don't know if any of you have ever gone through performance review process, but they're not a lot of fun. But this was very formal. And over the years, it changed. They had different flavors of it that came out, but we always had to do this annual review. And at one time, the flavor was that you had to make the subordinate write it themselves, the good, the areas for improvement. And I turned it into my boss, and my boss told me, you need to go back and edit this, take out all those areas for improvement. If your management has something negative to say about you, make them come up with it on their own. Don't feed it to them. So that worked with that boss, and we had a good relationship. Well, another year goes by, uh, my boss changed out, but I wrote my performance review saying just the positive stuff. And I went in for the meeting, and he literally threw it across the desk at me, and he goes, this is so perfect, your own mother wouldn't recognize you. <laughs> and I picked it up, and I was a little irked. I picked it up and I scanned it, you know, what's so horrible here? And I just went back to my, I actually laughed and I said, no, this is exactly what my mother would have written. <laughs> Noreen was a perfectionist. She expected a lot out of her children. And yeah, we know she was flawed and she knew we were flawed, but she did have an expectation of perfection from us, at least in the things that she viewed as important. Those of you who know her may realize that there were some things she didn't worry about, but if she worried about it, she did it all the way to perfection. Uh, she also helped my grandmother, Bernice Jorgensen, compile her own, my grandmother's history. And in that history, they had each of the siblings, of which there were six, write their histories. And it had good things, it had challenges in their life, it had some negative things in their lives. But when you got to Noreen's, there was no negative. And those of you who have my cousins who have a copy of that, read it. Noreen did not put a thing in there. I always thought that because it was because she was the editor, you know. She got the last say. But I was talking to my grandmother Bernice about it, and I said, you know what bothers me about this is there's nothing in here about mom's problems. And my grandmother said, oh no, Noreen was a perfect child. She never gave us any trouble. She always had good grades in school. She was the perfect child. That's kind of the expectation that we grew up with in the family. Um, and it's also why when I saw that performance review, I knew it was exactly what my mother would have written. She was smart, she was capable. When we grew up, we were told that she had never gotten anything but straight A's all the way through school, through high school, through her bachelor's degree, and through her master's program. And the expectation was we, her children, could do the same. And then uh, when my own sons were visiting her while they were going to college, she actually went and pulled out her high school transcript. And lo and behold, there were two Bs. <laughs> and she was very embarrassed about that. But I often think how different my life would have been if I had known about those two Bs. <laughs> the, uh, Kay mentioned that she got a bachelor's degree uh, at Utah State, and she did that in education. Um, she also got a master's degree in early childhood development. What Kay didn't really stress that I wanna make certain I stress, because you'll all recognize this in our family, is that Kay and I were pre-education children. Stephen was the post-education <laughs> children. And so when you meet him, you'll all agree, as everybody does who meets him, that he is the product of a better upbringing. Uh, <laughs> uh, I asked her once, I, why did you go into education? Because she was clearly a bright individual. And she actually said, no, I originally went to, uh, I think it was called Utah Agricultural College at the time, but she wanted to major in math. And the math teachers refused to put her into the program. And then she signed up for accounting. And the accounting professors, and you have to realize this is in the late 40s, the accounting professors said, well, this is futile for you because there's no, nobody's going to hire you when you get out. And so she went into education. 
But later in life, uh, when she was in her 60s, she went back to school for another degree. Maryland had a program where it was free tuition for anybody 62 years old and older. And so she actually went back to university and was working on an accounting degree. And I was visiting at one time and she had to go off in the evening to meet with her study group. And I made some side comment about, you know, what 20 year old wants to meet with an old lady in their study groups? She retorted to me, she said, when you set the curve in the class, everybody wants you in their study group. <laughs> and even in her 60s, she was getting straight A's and they actually put her photo on the cover of their senior education uh, magazine that they issued at, in Maryland. Um, our father was an electrical engineer, and when we grew up, he was the one who we thought was the math expert. And I was taking high school calculus, and I was really struggling with it. Uh, that's one reason I'm not an engineer. But I went to my father for help with some of my homework, and he said, no, 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 go talk to your mother. And then they both told me this story about when the Air Force had sent him back for education and he was getting his engineering degree, that he would, too was struggling with calculus. And my mother, even though she had never had a college class in calculus, she opened her, his textbooks, taught herself calculus to the degree that she could tutor him. And he was successful. And it was true, it was the same with me. Our father had no patience for that, but it was our mother who got us through our homework and our, our or whatever. She kind of had the attitude that she could do anything. She'd open the book and she'd figure it out. Um, she was also very independent. In fact, some of her neighbors commented to this to me, even as we were cleaning out her house. Uh, but up until the very end, she wanted to be independent. Uh, she was driving and taking care of herself completely until June, when she learned that she had cancer. And it was very hard to move her into the assisted living. She missed her friends, but she also just missed that independence. And actually when she was in assisted living, uh, she was really completely independent and not receiving any assistance right up until her final uh, week or two when she took a real dive before she passed. As children, though, we were also expected to be independent and to do everything. She'd never let you say no to something. If they gave you a talk at church, you had to give the talk at church. Uh, scouts, the programs. Our mother was the one who took us through our eagle projects. Uh, you'd think that was the father. No, in our family, it was our mother who did all that for us. She was sick a lot, but I don't remember her being sickly. You know, Kay mentioned she had scarlet fever, which took her hearing, but. She was also uh, appendicitis, ruptured spleen. Um, she had a brain tumor where they, uh, when they operated, it was a benign tumor, but when they operated, she picked up a hospital staff infection that actually got into the bone and they, if you didn't know her, she had had half her skull removed and there was a prosthesis up there. Um, later, she had a cochlear implant uh, put in to help her with her hearing. And one reason she only did it on one side is that the doctor put it into the wrong spot initially and it put it into her uh, sense of balance. And that's why she didn't have a very good sense of balance at the end. But I don't remember her being sickly. I remember her going and, and coming home from the hospital after a major operation. And she did stay in bed that day. But literally the next day she was up taking care of us. And on Wednesday she was in there. She was primary president at the time and she was back to doing it all. And I. Our kids and our grandkids remember she was deathly afraid of colds, but that's because she was afraid of losing what limited hearing she had left. Um, you know, the independence, though, could be seen as stubborn, and I probably shouldn't tell these stories, but particularly at the end, she was very stubborn. Uh, after I moved back to Utah, I helped her with her finances, and I helped her with her house and maintenance. And, as she was getting more feeble, we said, we need to put a railing in on the house. Oh no, I don't want a railing. That would interfere with how I get my water from my hose onto my geraniums. And we fought with her. And actually it was Gloria, her neighbor Gloria, who helped us in the end. We, we kind of learned that what you do is you go tell Gloria what you want. And then Gloria would convince my mother of what is it. And so thank you, Gloria. Uh, 
We even got stock tips from Gloria. And I remember once telling my mom, I said, Gloria can take over your finances. I would be very happy if Gloria just took over your finances and did everything. But uh, we never went that far. Uh, but in the end, and to kind of summarize, the one thing that I knew about my mother is she loved us. She could be quirky, she could be odd, she could be a perfectionist and tell you how you messed up, but she loved you unconditionally. And I think I knew that. I know my children, her grandchildren knew that. And that's a special thing to have in somebody is who knows you, loves you unconditionally. Um, you know, there's days I remember where it hadn't gone well at work. The wife was mad at me. The kids were mad at me. And you can sit there and go, yeah, but my mom loves me. And I leave you with that. That's my memory of Noreen. Uh, this is a sad time, but actually, um, one of the last things she taught me was really how to die. Uh, it was a privilege for me to take care of her at the end, to assist her in the years that she was a widow, but then also to assist her as we moved into assisted living, and then helped her up to the very end. Um, she was independent. She was loving. Um, you know, I can't really say anymore. I was very glad that she was my mother, and I leave this with you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Steve Cronquist, and then we'll end by having a uh, closing hymn, number 308, after which her grandson, Sean Robison, will give the closing prayer. I just want to thank everybody who's here. Um, as Doug mentioned, my mom did not want a service. She did not want to fuss about her. I think we all know that about her. Um, when I talked to her, I felt like she recognized one thing, though, and that was that she was the last torchbearer of her generation within our family. And that's something I mourn, losing that. Um, she knew that there were connections that get distant, and this was an opportunity to bring those together that we might not easily have. So you being here was mom's wish, and thank you. Thanks to the family that made it. Know that we love you. Thanks to the friends. I've talked to a lot of you from Shadow Mountain, her ward. As I told many of you, she reminded me every time I called her, she was in the best place with the best people. She could not imagine a better place to be. Um, I thought maybe she could be back on the East Coast where she came from, close to me. That would be a good place, but she loved it here. And thank you all for that. Um, lastly, thank you to my siblings. As Doug mentioned, um, I was back east, but they were taking care of mom in these last stages. The deep, the deep love that I saw them show, all oh, my respect. So mom, with her passing, I, I hope there's one person who can forgive mom, and that's mom herself. Mom carried a big measuring stick with which she graded herself. You heard about her perfectionism. I just always kind of picture, I don't know, kids on a playground comparing their measuring sticks. You know, look, look what I've accomplished, or look, you know, you know, we always compare each other too much in our life. And there's this little redheaded girl walking out trying to fit her measuring stick through the doors, banging against the walls, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, she's got a measuring stick. Um, she never would dwell on accomplishments. She would always look at what else could be done. I love her for that humility. Um, it could be challenging, but I feel at this point when mom hears those words, well done, and I believe she will, um, I think she'll finally drop that measuring stick. But she'll reach into her pocket and she'll pull out a list and she'll say, but Lord, look at all that stuff I didn't do. She will rat on herself, I promise you. <laughs> You know where you get it, Megan. <laughs> I love her for that. We all need Noreen's in our life, the people who dream of a better world and see a better place that we should be, the people who do all they can to make it so, and the people who carry us along on that ride. I love you for that, Mom. Um, I'm standing in the way of us spending more time together, so let me try to keep this a little tight, but two memories of Mom that I I want to carry forward. And as you've heard, it's of a loving mother. She always focused on family over her children. 
Uh, you heard she studied education, home economics, uh, things where she could have gone other directions. She pursued what would make her family stronger. And I like to go back to even where she had a chance to um, study and get a master's degree. And she did that in child development, right? I think I got that right. And there was a bound thesis she had on her bookshelf. And as a kid, I thought that was so cool. My mom is an author. It's just a thesis, but I pull it down and look at it. And then, wow, within that, pictures of my brother, Doug, my mom working with him. I was like, he's famous. He's in a book. He's published. <laughs> and then I got a little older and, and was taught in school about scientific method. And I realized, to my horror, my siblings had been lab rats. They were, <laughs> they were the rhesus monkeys of my mom. So as Doug said, by the time I came along, she had all the strings. She knew how to, she knew how to make me do what I was supposed to do. But everything she gave, she did not take, as a mother does. And all you mothers out there, here's to you. We lost one, but here's to moms. Um, the other thing about mom is music. Her favorite job, it's come out in different conversations, but her favorite job, her favorite calling in the church was that of primary chorister, and that is all seriousness. She loved that job, and I have a striking memory for me. It was nice to hear you girls play your memory. Um, for me, that was of a day where I just wanted to go home, and she was practicing with the primary. I was a young teenager, that easily embarrassed age. The last thing I wanted to do was see my mom leading primary in song. I, I slipped in the back of the room. I sat against the back wall, and I watched her. And they were singing, Give Said the Little Stream. And the kids were responding. And mom was up there, big, big arm motions. She was feeling it. Give, oh, give, give, oh, give. And the look on her face was pure joy. I'm not sure I've ever seen that look quite like that moment. She was in love with that moment, and it was joy. So when you think of mom, don't shed a tear. Sing, make music, feel joy. And that brings me to where I would like to end, and that's with music. Um, the one tragedy I always felt, if you call it that in mom's life, was her loss of hearing. Luckily, she never lost the ability to communicate with voice. But there was a day a few years ago, not that long ago, she told me music had become noise. She no longer could enjoy the hymns in church. It was noise to her. That broke my heart. Um, so I want to play a little bit. I always thought I would play for her because it was the last thing I couldn't do. Very selfish of me. You have places to be. We need to meet up and talk, but I'm going I'm to try to play for her. Um, I told mom that I was going to do this. I wasn't sure I should, but I told her towards her final days. And in a very tender moment, my mom turned to me, cocked her head and said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> So let me tell you why. Um, music is the voice of the heart, and music is the voice of the soul. Um, let me get this out of the way, because you'll hear imperfections. Um, yes, mom, wrong notes, too much pedal, uh, too slow a tempo. I'm not even sure the songs are appropriate. Um, and yes, I did not practice enough. Um, but I hope if this is noise, it's a beautiful noise.
Please, those who have time and can take the time, please join us afterwards at the cemetery so that we can build those bonds. Thank you. Dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, um, we bow our, time, our heads at this time, grateful to come together in loving memory of my wonderful grandma, Noreen Cronquist. We're grateful for the memories and, and stories and, and love which we've felt here today, and we're so grateful for um, this wonderful woman and, and the role she's played in all of our lives. We ask thee at this time, Father, to please bless us that we might carry this, this spirit with us the rest of this day, that we might continue to um, find joy and, 
and love and in all that we um, have felt here today and continue as um, we remember um, this special, amazing grandma that I've had in my life. And we ask thee to please continue to bless us, watch over us as we go forth this day that we might continue to honor her and um, be better, a little bit better each day. And we love thee and we say this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.